Welcome, everyone. everybody. I'm so excited to have you here with us uh, for our webinar, Spatial Visualization, a Promising Intervention for Promoting Student Equity. Just a reminder, yes, we are recording this webinar. And yes, as registrants, you will receive a link to this recording. Furthermore, at the end of the a webinar, we will, you will be able to download directly from this platform our presentation handout, some articles that we think will be valuable to you, as well as some other resources that we think will help you in your journey to develop your own intervention for your students. So at this point, I'd like to do a quick shout out to our co-sponsors, all of whom are passionate about equity in engineering education, I encourage you to go to their website, check out their resources and the information they have to share with us. I wanted to let you know that the goal that we have for this webinar is to share information that we hope will not only inspire but compel as well as help you develop your own spatial visualization training for your students. So with that goal in mind, we've uh, designed and organized the webinar to answer a series of questions, which you can see over on the left-hand column, the first of which is, why should I provide spatial visualization training skills for, skills training for my students? And with that in mind, let's go ahead and turn a question right back to you and have you answer a poll. So direct your eyes to the bottom of the screen where you'll be able to see a poll. And the question is, if you were to predict significant differences in spatial visualization skills, where do you think such differences might be found? And please check all that apply. Know that for your screen, you might have to actually scroll down to be able to see all five options that we've got available to you. So I see that people are responding. Thank you, everybody. We want to get everybody's voice in and completing this poll, know that we'll be addressing this information later on in the webinar. Just a few more seconds to allow everybody to answer this. Five, four, three, two, one. OK, now what I'd like to do is introduce our speakers. Um, Know that you'll be able to read their detailed bios in the presentation handout that you'll be able to download at the end of the webinar. But at the top of your screen, you see uh, Susan Metz, who is PI for the Engage Engineering Project, which is the sponsor for today's webinar. Her day job, she is the Executive Director for Diversity and Inclusion at Stevens Institute of Technology. And then right in the middle screen, you've got Jackie, Dr. Jackie, Oh, well, that's not Jackie, that's Jacob Siegel and Jackie Sullivan, who are faculty at CU Boulder. Um, they have been instrumental in designing and implementing the spatial visualization intervention that we are showcasing today. So with that said, Susan, if you would please tell us all about the fabulous Engage Engineering uh, resources that are available and also help us to answer the question, why should I provide spatial visualization skills training for my students? Take it away, Susan. Thanks so much, Gretel. Well, since 2010, Engage Engineering has been disseminating research-based strategies to STEM faculty for the purpose of increasing retention among first and second year engineering students at a time when they're particularly vulnerable to switch out of engineering. Engage is focused on three specific retention strategies, including using everyday examples to teach technical concepts, increasing faculty-student interaction in and out of the classroom, and the topic of today's webinar, improving spatial visualization skills of students who lack proficiency in that area. The research tells us that the strategies improve retention among all engineering students but they are disproportionately effective with women and underrepresented minorities. No doubt most of you probably know what I'm referring to when I say, when I use the term spatial visualization skills or SVS, but in case this is new to you, it's the ability to translate 2D objects to 3D and mentally rotate 3D objects. Here's a short video that um, illustrates mental rotation 
training using cubes. The PSVTR or Purdue Spatial Visualization Test Rotation is a very common assessment instrument that tests this skill. It's 30 questions in 20 minutes. A review of research over the decades offers strong evidence that spatial visualization skills are critical to success in STEM disciplines, especially engineering. Engineering graphics, as you know, is a gateway course to many engineering disciplines and it requires solid SVS skills. For students beginning their engineering study, being deficient in these skills puts them at a distinct disadvantage at the very get-go. And at a time when there is national imperative to broaden participation in engineering, a meta-analysis of 50 years plus of research illustrates that men perform better than women on tests of mental rotation. Underrepresented minorities, first-generation students, and international students also underperform on these mental rotation tests. The very good news is that spatial visualization skills is a cognitive skill that's malleable and can improve with practice. In fact, Dr. Cheryl Sorby, a well-known NSF-funded researcher in this area, has created a curriculum that can be taught in about 15 hours. Her curriculum has been tested over decades and is extremely successful in increasing test scores on that PSVTR assessment. And at Michigan Tech, where her, the majority of her research was done, she has shown that it increases retention as well. And that's, of course, key. Using Sorby's curriculum, Engage has worked with 40 engineering schools, including University of Colorado Boulder, to implement SV skills assessment and training programs over the past six years. And to sum up, here are the facts. SVS skills are critical for engineering success. Subpopulations of students like women and underrepresented minority are, minorities are less likely to be proficient in these skills, primarily because of lack of experience. And SV skills can be learned with a modest level of practice. So if we want to broaden participation in engineering education, we have to provide spatial visualization training to help students who lack this critical, teachable, prerequisite skill so they can be successful. Based on Cheryl Sorby's Developing Spatial Thinking curriculum, Jacob Siegel and Jackie Sullivan at CU Boulder have developed a spatial visualization skills intervention model that's incredibly exciting. The results are very impressive and the training takes even less time than Cheryl's curriculum. It is scalable and replicable. And Jackie, I'm passing the mic to you to tell us more about the work that you are doing at CU Boulder. Thanks. Great. We too want to chime in and thank you all for coming today. Um, at at CU Boulder, we're committed to broadening participation in engineering, and we're committed to do that in any and all ways possible. And our commitment to equity in, takes many forms, which includes addressing gender disparities and 3D spatial visualization skills among our first-year engineering students. So there, we had a number of motivations. Uh, as uh, Susan said, Spatial visualization skills, especially the ability to visualize in three dimensions, are critical to STEM disciplines, especially to engineering. And Dr. Thorby's work showed that the greater gen greatest gender disparity in mental is in the mental rotation of 3D objects. So what originally drove us here was all the evidence-driven work in the literature, being a WePAN partner. I will tell you that uh, Susan Metz's review of the literature that she did for Awe and Kathy at NAE in 2012 was a major driver for us. We've used it in faculty training sessions a dozen times probably. And so we're very evidence-driven in our work, and we have a three-pronged approach 
to broadening participation in engineering at CU Boulder around access, retention, and performance. We view spatial visualization as key to both the access, uh, really key to all three, key to access, um, leveling the playing field for our engineering students, key to retention, them staying in engineering, and key to the performance, how they actually do in their follow-on engineering classes. So we, um, uh, we're experimenters, and we we're experimenters, and we ourselves use the design process to come about with this intervention we're going to chat with you about today. We have, we, as I said, read the literature extensively, but we tried to cheap out. We tried to find easier and less expensive approaches. At our institution, having a special spatial visualization um, course was off the table. Our uh, our college was not ready to do that, and so we looked at how outside of that we could create a model that could support multiple first-year engineering design courses and touch the bulk of our students. So we came up with many models. In our 2015 ASWE paper, we described three of those models that, that failed. They got statistically significant results, but in our mind, they, they failed. So we took a lot of risk. We learned from our pilots, and we kept spinning the flywheel for success. And we ourselves have come up with the model that we're going to share with you today. And again, um, our results point very clearly to what Dr. Metz said. There is no question that spatial visualization skills are cognitive skill that can be improved with practice. They can be learned. We often talk in-house that it's like riding a bike. Once you get that skill, you've got it. And if you don't get on that bike for a while, you get on that bike and you've got it. It changes your view of the world. So Jacob, take it from here on what we what we actually measure in our workshop. Good. So in order to assess these various in interventions that we've applied in our in our institution, we use the Purdue Spatial Visualization Test rotation. Uh, you'll hear um, you've you've heard of this already from Dr. Metz. We we apply it in a 30 minute, 30 multiple choice setting. And we, and we know that it is a well-validated instrument from the literature. That, that is why we've chosen it. You'll hear us talk about two different uh, measures today. We'll talk about our student's performance score. That's an integer between 0 and 30. It, it, it describes the, the number of questions that were answered correctly. We'll also use the term passing rate. That's the percentage of our students who achieved the score of 20 or more. Um, that, is, uh, that is also a, a measure that we use, that 20-point threshold it's also based in some of the engaged literature as well. Thank you. So for us, we were sharing with you today results of an intervention we've done over four semesters with 1,521 first-year engineering students. And over that population, 83% of our students initially passed the Purdue Spatial Visualization Test. We asked ourselves in-house, well, oh, isn't that good enough? There's a lot of things we need to invest resources in. There's a lot of things we need to work on. 83% isn't bad. But then we, but we were well aware, um, and with a big push from WePAN, we were well aware of the gender gap and spatial skills performance, and we started unpacking that data. And as we, as we looked deeper, we were uh, not surprised to find that when we disaggregated the data, 68% of our women passed, so 83% of our overall population, but 68% of our women, which compared to 88% of our men, passed in that 83%. So 20, 20 point we, difference. A 20 point difference. We were quite taken aback with that, but not surprised from the literature. We kept unpacking that data. We found that only 61% of our international students initially passed the spatial visualization test Clearly, we, we thought in looking at this result, an intervention is called for. When we look at these two populations of students, our international students and our women students, these are intentionally growing populations in our college. We work hard to, retain, to recruit these students, and we sure don't want to lose them in early losses because they're discouraged with not having the skill. And this was, well, this was what, what I was struck by. So I, I teach the spatial uh, visualization uh, workshop here at CU. And what I noticed is that my classroom looks different. Uh, I teach a, a variety of other design courses as well. Uh, but only in the spatial visualization workshops did I see an overrepresentation of women and an overrepresentation of international students. These, uh, these numbers are compared to our college at large. We saw 1.7 times overrepresentation of women and a 2.6 times 
overrepresentation of, of international students. So to cut to the chase, uh, for the 251 uh, workshoppers that we had over our four semesters uh, of this in particular intervention, we saw an overall passing rate starting at zero. That is, by definition, our workshoppers were students who did not pass originally. And we moved that passing rate to 91%. Also, when we disaggregate the data further, we saw that we saw, we saw a performance gain of 23% uh, over, over five different dichotomous groupings of students by various demographic characteristics. We looked at uh, gender, women and men, as we described, international and domestic students, as well as minority, majority. Uh, uh, we had first generation and not, and low socioeconomic status and not. And across all of those uh, all of those demographic subsets, we saw the same 23% or 7-point gain. So, so just a, a quick look at what we saw in terms of passing rate. So remember, Jacob said there's two things we look at. We look at the passing rate getting over that threshold of 20, and then as well as their actual performance score gain, which he has just um, shared with you. And and on average, we see that score jump seven points from 15 to 22, from 16 to, to 23. And that's pretty consistent across all of our groups. Um, we may need to move some subpopulations of those students further than others, but that seven-point gain is consistent. We're happy to see that because that means the intervention is effective for all students. And that's our definition of equity. Equity is equity. So just as a, a, a quick review, uh, before and after with women in the workshop, we had a 68% passing rate. Uh, in our whole population, among our entire population, we have a 96% passing rate after the workshop. Men before the workshop, remember passed in that 83%, we had saw an 88% passing rate initially for our men, moving to a 99% passing rate after the workshop intervention. Uh, continuing to unpack for our international students, we had a 61% passing rate before the workshop and a 92% um, passing rate after. Now, this is our lowest passing rate among all subpopulations of our students. Because equity is equity, we'll share with you. We're not happy yet. We're still spinning the flywheel. We've really just gotten large enough numbers to be able to unpack this difference. And so while we moved this population of students the furthest, they started at 61%, moved to 92 they're pretty happy with that 31% gain. But we're not happy enough yet with 92%. So stay tuned there. We've got to unpack that and dig deeper. And among our domestic students, we started with 85% passing rate and got to a 99%. So you see the big difference between our domestic and our international students. So, in closing the gender gap, which is initially, again, where we started. That was our motivation, right? We were very honed by WePAN and the Engage Project to close the gender gap. So what we saw in our post-workshop passing rate for men, we went from overall starting at 88% and getting to 99%. Even we're happy with 99%, right? Although well, our initial challenge to Jacob was to get to 100%. We backed off and said, okay, we're pretty, we're pretty okay with 99%. Among our women, our post-workshop passing rate, post-workshop passing rate is 96%. Again, moving further than we moved with our male population, where we saw the movement of 11%. Here we moved from 68 to 96. Again, not totally happy with 96. We'll continue to work on that and continue to hope, uh, hone our workshop design and our presentation. I'll hold you there. Pat Coe has a quick question about the shape of the curves before and after. Uh, these, these, um, we're, uh, he's wondering if the, if the scores are very low or near misses. And we've looked at that. So the, the average pre-test score of our workshoppers was, was at a 17, 17 out of 30, uh, and their p average post post-test score was at a 23. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you some sense. There were there are some near misses, meaning there are students scoring 19 out of 30 and just missing that passing threshold. Um, a lot of that detail is in our is in our uh, FIE paper um, that's been that a draft of which is provided to you at the end of this webinar. So I, I'll direct you there. Now and one of the uh, um, one of the things that we're interested in there is empirical evidence for in fact is 20 
the right threshold. Some institutions are using 18. We're asking the question, what about students that are at 20, 21, and 22? Because we move our workshoppers from 16, 17, some even 15, to um, um, as subpopulations to 23. What about those students that are 21, 20, 21, and 22? We're a little concerned that the intervention, um, that we may need to raise the bar for the, the assessment intervention and be doing more to move those students that are in the 2021. Again, this is, this is our work as it unfolds. So we want to share with you the design and implementation of our spatial visualization workshop. And Jacob's going to take it away. Definitely. So now let's get into the details. We'll tell you what we did and how we did it. Uh, we, we certainly started with Dr. Sorby's work and, and actually her textbook, as shown on the screen, Developing Spatial Thinking, was uh, sort of the founding uh, resource that we used to develop this intervention. Then we, we took some of our Montessori background and tried to apply it to this, to this topic. So we, we like a low-tech, hands-on, multimodal sort of approach where students are, are, are using multi, multiple sensory sort of inputs to study these topics and to practice their spatial visualization skills. We paired with a first year design with, with multiple first year design courses. So there are three different courses here at CU Boulder that we partnered with. That means I'm working with 10 to 15 faculty members per semester. We have 300 to 500 students across all of those different design courses. And uh, so there's many sections of those courses a semester. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so if you do the math on it, you say, oh, that's not three design courses. Some of them have 10 or 11 sections in a given semester taught by different faculties. Correct. And so what we've done is we've, we've partnered with those, uh, with those courses. We've required those faculty to allocate 5% of the semester grade to passing the spatial visualization test. And then what we hold are after hours workshops. So if the students don't pass uh, the Purdue spatial visualization test originally, which is given in class during the first week, then they come to after hours workshops with me. I hold them twice a week. Uh, as well as a makeup session on a Sunday afternoon. And we do that for four weeks before we assess again. Uh, and we'll give you all those details uh, coming up here in a minute. Almost got what everybody next, completed. Uh, what the, happens when the, the students poll, first arrive uh, in our classroom in the first week seconds, of class is that we provide the Purdue spatial visualization test here. So to get ourselves warmed up, let's get our spatial visualization muscles uh, you know, ready. Uh, go ahead Looks and like uh, try to answer this question here. Now. There should be a poll on Thank your you screen. Uh, this is an example from the Purdue Spatial Visualization Test. The first object is rotated to the to the second orientation as the as the question here is rotated to A, B, C, D, or or E. Go ahead and take 10 seconds, 20 seconds or so, and, and answer the question. Great. The correct answer is D. Uh, we study, uh, we talk in our workshops about how to solve these sort of these mental rotation problems, uh, and, I'll, and I'll detail that when we get there. So we'll walk you through how we, how we set up this intervention. Uh, after that, that, that Purdue spatial visualization test is given in the first week, I manage all the results. I, uh, well, analyze all the results, and I start a communication directly with the workshoppers, those students who didn't pass as well as their faculty members. Uh, in, that, in that email, I, I, I described the same things I just told you. This, this passing this assessment accounts for 5% of your grade. Uh, you'll be attending at these times in these rooms. Um, and, and that will be exercising. It's, I try to frame this as just we're just practicing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to work together to get better at this skill. Then we'll be better prepared mm -hmm. for engineering curriculum as we move on in our design work coursework, as well as mm -hmm. many other classes. Mm -hmm. I really like how the communication from Jacob really emphasizes we and us. 
it isn't you and you have to do this. It's very much a collaborative we and us. This is going to be a collaborative workshop. You're going to work with other students. I'm going to work with you. And we're going to get through this. We're going to do this. We're going to exercise our muscles. We're going to learn these very learnable skills. I think it's a very non-scary communication. Yes. And I admit to you know my own well participation and the, how the way the practice that helps me as well. Hey, so, Jacob, you've got uh, a quick well, question for you right there that says, so your structure is an optional seminar you have students do and not a separate course for credit. I think that's a good one to answer at this point. Definitely. Uh, the, the, the workshop series is not optional. It is required for students who don't pass the assessment originally. Yeah. And, and the driver for that is one of the models we tried was an optional voluntary model, even though Susan Metz in, uh, in her literature review was very clear that optional models don't work. We didn't become convinced until we tried it. So back to it is, an, it is a required component. Passing this is binary for students. Getting a passing grade in special, special this counts for 5% of their course grade as determined by their faculty member for their design course. So uh, in any given design course, uh, section of the course, our sections are about 30 students, 30 to 32. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe among those four or five students have not initially passed the spatial viz course. Those students, the faculty member will know who those students are. So Jacob is communicating with them. But also the faculty member is communicating with those students because they get to communicate every week for who showed up who is attending. Attendance at the workshop is required for them to retake the assessment in week four. So coming is non-optional. They have three times in a week. They can come to workshop one, three times the next week. They can come to workshop two. But coming is non-optional if they want that 5% of their grade. A very tiny percent, about 1% of students actually never show up. And yes, that is the the five percent of their design course grade is the is our that's our method of holding our students accountable. Right. Are there students who say uh, I don't need the five percent? Yeah, a handful. We've had uh, 1,500 students come through this intervention, and, and as as you can see from our results, you know most of the students uh, attend and pass. There are a handful that that that, that we mm -hmm. with all of our encouragement don't attend, and they lose that five percent of their mm -hmm. semester grade. Um, and keep it's it, a small, small portion, let's say a dozen students out of 15. Yeah, and keep in mind, their professor of their design course is talking to them regularly. Hey, Jacob, I saw you didn't show up for facial viz this week. Are you going to the Sunday makeup? Might be the typical kind of an intervention. And then again, sharing with the students why this is a, a skill critical. We do workshops for all the faculty so they understand the evidence and research-based strategy that we're jointly employing here. Great. I'll take one more question now. Uh, Jamie is asking, can a non-PhD or non-engineer run these workshops, or can a grad student run them? We'll, we'll detail that here in a minute. About you know, We'll go through pros and cons of this intervention. I would say, yes, it is possible. I, I learned these skills getting ready to teach mm -hmm. this class. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I am a mechanical engineer by training, but I think it is very possible for, mm -hmm. for other, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, graduate students uh, mm -hmm. in, in a variety of disciplines to take on mm -hmm. uh, an intervention like in our, um earlier interventions, though we tried the lower cost grad student approach, and we were not successful with that. We tried it with undergrad students running the workshops, and we tried with a grad student absolutely owning the workshops, and it was a failure. Uh, we were very unhappy with our results. Um, we, again, statistically significant results in working towards closing the gender gap, but those results we characterized as good is the enemy of great. They were okay results. Right. Some might even say good. They sure weren't great, and they weren't our best, and they didn't get the kind of results we see here. We just couldn't get there with a grad student at yeah. the helm. There were other things that were different in that intervention, uh, and so let's. Uh, and we'll talk more, more about that when we talk about the models. Yes, yes. And, and our ASW 2015 yeah. paper describes those in detail. No. And that, that's one of the resources provided for the workshop. We go through all of our four different model designs in terms of people, places, and things, and our outcomes from those there. Yep. So to get back to, 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 get back to this workshop overview, we, we follow this progression. And over the first four weeks of the workshop, we study isometric drawing, orthographic views, 
one and two axis rotations before we review and, and retake the Purdue spatial visualization test. Those topics were recommended to us by Dr. Cheryl Sorby. Then we dive into some uh, four students who don't pass the Purdue spatial visualization test at that week four mark. We do provide a second session. So we provide four more weeks of workshops where we dive further into some of the skills that we find most, uh, most troublesome for some of our students. That has to do with curved surfaces, inclined planes, time testing and rotation strategies before we review and test again. That is our entirety of our workshop. It takes place uh, in the first eight weeks of the semester so that our students can, first of all, gain the skill uh, as soon as possible. Then also it's before some of the crunch mm -hmm. of, of most of their coursework. Uh, so that, that, that is what the eight weeks looks like. Next, we'll talk about what an individual session looks like. So uh, during those two hour um, evening sessions, we rotate students through four different stations. We have a group station where students are working as a team to solve problems. We have an individual station where they have time to reflect on their own and work on these, on, on these concepts. A peer teach station where students are in teaching each other, mainly demonstrating to each other how they solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And then also a computer station where we, where we um, talk about, click one more, yep. where we talk about the, well, we, we use the, the, the software provided by Dr. Cheryl Sorby's textbook to visualize and animate some of these same mm -hmm. ideas. So you can see several different strategies we employ here for students to find the problem-solving approach that works best for them to attain these spatial visualization skills. Again, this is our commitment that this is a learned skill, it's a cognitive skill that can be learned, and they just need practice, they need exposure and practice, and there's multiple different ways that that works better or not for some students. So each week they come in, they know they're going to encounter this group station, an individual station, peer teaching station, and computer-based station. Definitely. And so here's, you know, here's an example of what week one looks like. Uh, I start the session with, uh, with usually like a live example. So here I'll demonstrate how to draw um, an isometric view of, of a three-dimensional object. I'll, uh, basically, I'll, I'll be doing this live in front of the students, just like I am right now for you. The idea here is that they get a taste of what this skill looks like before they dive into those three different uh, stations where they're practicing their spatial visualization skills. Of course, what we're doing here is we're asking them to manipulate 2D and 3D objects in their mind. We have them do that from a mul multiple different perspectives so that they can um, practice, well, so that they can find the, um, the method that is best for them. Uh, you better believe that we do a lot of sketching uh, as described by, Dr. By, 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 by the literature. The sketching is, is certainly a, a, an important um, aspect of, of this skill and we utilize it probably over in over half of our over half of the time of our workshops we are uh, sketching. Um, I'll be doing I'll, I'll describe isometric drawing and what it entails like uh, during during the beginning of the workshop and then we dive into the four different stations. So station one during our first week is a group block relay. What this means is that our students take cues, they build objects, and they have isometric paper in front of them where they draw. Uh, they, then, uh, they then pass their objects to their neighbors. Uh, and so we have this sort of uh, relay race going on where they're drawing objects uh, from their peers. You better believe that there's competition at times where students build bigger and bigger objects and then challenge their neighbors to draw them as well. Um, this is a, well, it's a, an interactive station where the students get to um, practice their skills and then also compare answers so they get to see how they, they do the objects versus their partners, their neighbors. The second station for this, for this first week is, is, is when we dive into the individual workbook drill. This is when we, we take practice problems from Dr. Sorby's book and we uh, have students work individually. This gives them time to, to, to assess their own skills. Uh, we provide answer keys so that they can check themselves along the way and then myself and a TA are floating around the room to answer questions if they do arise. Station three is our peer teaching station. So here, uh, the example shown is a coded plan where we're drawing different isometric views of that coded plan. Our students practice the, they practice solving this problem and then they teach their partner how to do it. And so here is when we see uh, different strategies come about. One partner will draw the, the, the isometric view in one way. 
the other will draw in another way. We get to talk about the differences and, and, and sometimes develop better strategies for how to how to do this, how to perform this skill. Finally, we have a computer aided visualization station. This is when we dive into the software provided by Dr. Sorby's group, uh, by, by Dr. Sorby's book, and we look at uh, it helps us uh, animate and and sometimes uh, visualize some of these concepts. Uh, our students like this station because it is uh, well. Um, it gives them that interactive uh, period so that they can watch as shapes are rotated mm -hmm. and they can see the drawings take place uh, on their screens. Um, looks like we have a question from Sebastian. Can you Could you tell if your students improved their spatial, visual, spatial visualization skills or just skills taking the test? Thank you. Good question. Mm -hmm. uh, so we particularly, we, we specifically do not uh, work on the test whatsoever. They only see the test in that first week of their design course and in that fourth week of our workshop. They never see it in between. Uh, we do that purposefully so that we're not just teaching to the test. Uh, we, these skills, isometric drawings, orthographic views, one and two axis rotations are certainly, uh, they, they, they are tested in that, in that, um, in that assessment. The Purdue Spatial Visualization Test Rotations is specifically about one and two axis rotations. Mm -hmm. uh, do we ever practice the exact test problems? The answer is no. Okay, and Pat, you've asked the question similar to Sebastian. Um, or no, who asked the question about K-12? Um, I saw a K-12 question, it went away. Huh? Yes, yeah, yeah, would this training be suitable for high school students? Is there any literature to support the use of SV in K-12? That's from Leslie. So, so there's a lot of evidence in the literature that the earlier you learn these skills, the malleable skills, cognitive skills, the earlier they use it, the, the earlier it changes the sort of world view. So there's a lot of evidence that the, the earlier, that, that this intervention should be done at preschool, it should be done in elementary school, it should be done at home, it should be done in high school. And for lots of children it is, right? That's why we see an 83% pass rate among our students, and we tend to have a majority dom, a majority high SES population of students. But absolutely, sorties materials are used in high school and at, in K-12, and we, do, have we published yet? Or, we're right on the yeah. cusp of publishing a unit on spatial visualization skills in the Teach Engineering Digital Library that you can find at teachengineering.org, and that's a collection of hands-on engineering curricula designed for K-12 all the way truly from kindergarten through high school. Great. I'm going to keep the ball moving. Okay. We're going to talk about cost here, and there was a que there were questions early. I totally empathize with anybody that's asking the question is, can you do this for less? And agreeing with what Jacob said, we've rung out this model, and we have a model at work. We've been chatting recently about, could you hire an adjunct professor? Could you have somebody who's interested in engineering education take this on for a year or two in their PhD? And, and what I would say to that is we invest on the, the premises that these skills are malleable and they're affected by both educational and life experiences and they're, they're critical to retention, differentially critical to different populations of our students. For us, we took the faculty approach. For, for Dr. Siegel, one-fifth of his teaching assignment for the entire year is teaching this course, teaching up to eight weeks, so the first four-week series when most of the students will pass the assessment at the end of the four weeks. Some come back to the second four weeks, or if they didn't do it in the first four weeks, most do. Um, so that's eight weeks of the semester. Dr. Siegel does this each semester. Taken together, that is one-fifth of his teaching load or one course equivalent, one course credit for the year, and it turns out that that's about the face time of the, um, he's with the students if he teach, when he teaches both workshops twice a week, he's with the students 64 hours a year. That's about right for us for a three credit on a semester system um, design course. So keep in mind that only 17% of our students are workshoppers, are students who didn't pass that initial threshold of 20. So. Our model here, almost all, you can see $20,000 of our $21,700 in annual cost is going for the faculty salary and benefits. Some of that includes benefits. With 
17% of our students benefiting from the intervention. It really supports us then to have a first year cohort of over 1,500 uh, engineering students. So uh, that is the model we've taken on. But yes, you could imagine doing that. Um, we look frozen up here. I don't know if this is frozen up or if this is working here. You are frozen, but keep going. We can hear you. And um, can you move the slide me? forward? There we yes, go. Yes, I can. So we'll talk about model execution here. So we have a, a model we call a one-to-many model, following several, again, of Dr. Sorby's and Susan Mess's recommendations. So Dr. Sorby recommends a separate course, as we said, in spatial vis. That wouldn't fly in our environment. So our environment, we have a one-to-many. Our workshop intervention supports many first-year engineering design courses. Um, again, we talked about voluntary volu attendance is not voluntary because it is 5% of their course grade. So if we were to go ahead and look, um, look ahead, you could see, um, let's go to the next slide and look at the pros. So we, for our, again, we're not saying this is the be all and end all of every model. This is the model that worked in our fairly curriculum uh, innovation resistant environment, I would say. So we thought one of the great advantages is there's no course curriculum changes required. So we didn't have to negotiate with electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and, and aerospace engineering because this is all done after hours. What we do do is gain collaboration from the department chairs and from the, the faculty that they participate. So if you're a faculty teaching these design courses, it is non-optional to participate. But there's no ramping up by our design course faculty. In our various models, we try to employ our design course faculty. We say, hey, come and take this workshop. This is not going to be very difficult. We can help you figure it out. And you can teach this intervention. That did not work for us at all. We had very broad range of confidence in their own spatial visualization skills among our faculty. I would say I'd go from a range of confidence to just flat out fear. Um, our workshop third pro is a reasonable time demand for students, spending about eight hours in the workshop. Almost all of them pass after that. So, and it's in the first four weeks of the semester. We talked about the reasonable time demand for one faculty teaching credit at 64 contact hours over the entire year. Also, we find that our model scalable. If you have a larger room, you need a few more, a little more Play-Doh, a few more bandanas, more of the blocks. It's not a few more workbooks. It's very scalable with the addition of another undergrad TA, which in our environment runs uh, just under $1,200 a year. And again, for us, a key for us was the accountability being ensured with 5% of the course grade. Now, if we look at what the cons are, we were really racking our brains with this because we actually didn't have many cons. We had a lot of cons to our earlier implementation designs, which is why we're not doing them anymore. A con clearly is it requires a commitment by the design course faculty. And in our case, we get the commitment from department chairs. It is communication intensive. Jacob communicates a lot with these students. So we, and that part of that results in a lot of moving parts. He communicating with the students, he's communicating with all those faculty members every week for who's attending or not attending, because if their students aren't attending, we want them to nudge their students um, and nudge their students and say, hey, uh, Jamie, I noticed that you weren't at the workshop. You, you've missed the spatial visualization workshop and just have that accountability at that level. So lots of moving parts. Data management and integrity is always important because we're doing longitudinal assessment here. Our goal long term here is we're going to be tracking the long term both academic performance as they progress through the engineering curriculum as well as their retention through to graduation, six year retention. So we'll be tracking all of these students and so this is, you're seeing our results from the first two years of a many year enterprise. There is another downside that dawned on us, though, and it's that element of surprise. So students register for courses. There's nothing in 
their whole registration procedure, that would say to them, hey, and by the way, if you don't pass the spatial visualization assessment in class the first week of class, uh, you're going to need to be coming to a workshop Sunday, Tuesday, or Thursday for the first four weeks. So that's a little bit of a cluster with our students and right. takes them by surprise. What I would say, though, is that the, you know, the real, the way I phrase it, at least, is that this is, this is, this is exercise we're going to practice now mm -hmm. because it's going to help you in your design course, your calculus course, your chemistry course, and uh, you might as well give it a shot. You might as well come and join us because we know, we see the statistics, we see, we see the literature, and we see that it helps. And so I try to get that across to our students right away. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly I have some pushback, um, but it is, uh, well, uh, after that initial hurdle, let's say, of motivating our students, we see great attendance. We see, you know, mm -hmm. uh, attendance is equal to what we see yeah. in our, our required courses, or our, our, at least our, uh, the courses that are originally in their course yeah. calendar, yeah. We have a couple of quick questions here that's asked, is it reasonable to ask all students to do this rather than the ones who didn't pass? The literature is fairly clear on this, that if you have students that have highly honed spatial visualization skills taking the workshop with those that don't, you can get into um, uh, a situation where the students with less developed skills have uh, a lower sense of self-confidence, self-efficacy, and in fact get into a stereotype situation there. So we purposely do not invite all students to attend. We are really consciously working with those students that struggle. So I think that's been well addressed. We do offer spatial visualization in our summer bridge programs. We have two summer bridge programs here that Jacob works with. So we do offer that. And, and in fact, I think if you look at our data, um, unlike some reportings in the literature that find uh, a disparity in spatial visualization skills, initial skills between a minority and majority students. We don't find that here, but a pretty significant number of our minority students do attend summer bridge programs here where spatial visualization is part of the curriculum, and then they come back in the fall and take the spatial vis test again with their design course cohort. So I'm going to turn this over now and pass this back to Gretel, who is going to manage the whole question answer process, and we are at your disposal. Again, we did want to say we're part of a learning community. We're learning as we go here. We have a great team of people here that help pick apart our, our results all the time, and so We'll learn from your questions, too, and we welcome them. Thank you, Jackie and Jacob. Great job so far. We've got a number of questions that have come in. And for specifics, um, how about this one from Jessica, who asks, 64 hours is for how many sections? You say that the students have multiple ops to make up se uh, for makeup sessions. So please address that. Good. Thanks, Thanks for that question. Uh, let's clarify. Uh, I teach the workshops the first eight weeks of the semester. I teach twice a week for two hours each. If you add up those hours plus the next semester of teaching, uh, that equals 64 hours of in-class time for me as an instructor. That is a that is one teaching credit uh, for for my uh, for my faculty uh, teaching load appointment. Um, the question is asking how many. You say that the students have multiple options plus makeup sessions. Yes. So those students can attend either Tuesday, Thursday nights, for example, and if they have work or extracurriculars during those times, they can attend on a Sunday makeup session held by my TA. So we expect each student to attend one two-hour session a week for four weeks if they pass that assessment at the end of four weeks. Great. And you mentioned a TA. Do you offer training for your TAs prior to this? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, our TAs, uh, and, and we should clarify that we've done this for four semesters. For four semesters now, I've had two TAs over those four semesters. Both had been in previous F spatial visualization workshops, so their training, you could say, came from when they when they took the, the course as a student. Mm -hmm. We purposely we, recruit TAs that struggled themselves, yes. so they know what it's like to be a workshopper because they were workshoppers. And they and they and they're really. At, uh, in a lot of ways, a better resource than I am because they 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 found those strategies that got them over the hump. Our TAs describe how they started with a score of a 13 and they got to a 28, and you know here are the things that clicked. Um, and so it's um, 
luckily we've had really strong TAs and um, what I know is that our workshoppers would be great. They uh, they are undergraduate TAs. They're they're typically they, they have been uh, undergraduate engineering majors, um, and they've 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 taken our first year design course mm -hmm. uh, during their during their degrees, and that's that's sort of how we found them. And we purposely select for students that aren't much older than our workshoppers. Yeah aren't much further advanced in the engineering career. We want our workshoppers to be able to identify with our TAs. Oh, here's someone that struggled and is very open about having gotten a 13. Yep. Oh, geez. Well, I'm going to tell you that I got an 11. Yep. <laughs> and what would you say is the primary difference between your model and that of Dr. Sorby's? Sure. So what we've, what we've added is this multimodal element where we have students, uh, we have students building, we have students drawing, we have students uh, using Play-Doh. We have we have exercises where they're blindfolded and they have to uh, they have to feel an object and describe it out loud. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what we're probing is this multiple perspective. We we want students to attack these concepts from multiple angles because we what we hope is that those uh, like the literature shows, uh, when when we study these from other perspectives, we can we can help our students the most. And we very much want our, and have these workshops. Jacob talks about them being multimodal, but they're very collaborative, right? Communication is so important in them. Being able to talk about, describe, draw, draw blindfolded, be able to draw it, be able to be on the other side of that peer group. Um, you're the one describing while the other person's drawing, and and helping somebody else visualize it. So uh, this peer teach model is very much a key component. Of ours. But it, again, it comes back to both of us and our Montessori background and really wanting to push this multimodal, low-tech approach. It just works better for us in our environment. Uh, the high-tech computer-based approach was really not very successful for us. No. There's something well, how would you reckon, hmm, I, how would you recommend a, a novice person start? Um, can they start on your shoulders? Do you have a curriculum that we could just take and use, or, or how would you recommend that we start? Uh, great question. We're, we will certainly, you know, we, we've described a lot of these uh, techniques in, 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 in the ASWE paper and our the current FIE uh, 2016 paper. Uh, we, we certainly hope to provide these resources open source. Uh, they're, they're not yet ready. Uh, you can see we're, we're, changing, we're, we're learning as we go. Uh, so certainly we hope to get get some open source curriculum out uh, soon, let's say over the summer um, or in, in the upcoming year, academic year. Uh, and that's uh, and then we can also start, uh, and, and then of course we will direct everyone to Dr. Sorby's uh, developing spatial thinking textbook and her software. Mm -hmm. It's certainly where we started and it's a great, uh, great place mm -hmm. to, to begin. I did want to add one thing and that is in our environment, I can see some of you are talking about taking the assessment. We actually, another uh, deviation from Cheryl's work is we do a 30-minute assessment, not a 20-minute assessment. We give students more time on that assessment to take some of the anxiety around time because our students, that time testing works for some students and the anxiety around that, those time constraints, uh, um, diminishes performance of other students. So we say, well, who cares, right? This is a skill. Who cares if they can do it really fast? So we, we chill out on that and we do a 30-minute uh, assessment instead of a 20. Hey, just an interesting comment. I appreciate what you're talking about, but we've got some interesting comments happening here that are saying it'd be great if you do a train the trainer sometime too. So as you're thinking about developing your curriculum um, and you know having a curriculum in a box or a toolkit or something, you might also think about offering um, train the trainer options. Um, so another question we have is how did you get the money to develop your program? Um, $21,000 isn't to peanuts. Well, to some, well, I'm a co-director. <laughs> she has the money. So, um, okay. Yeah, we, we decided that the literature was so clear on this. This was an issue of broadening participation. Look what we spend on recruiting women students. Look yep. what we spend, look at the money we hemorrhage when we lose 
these talented young women from our pool of future engineers. For us, it was a societal imperative. To be very honest with you, some of the faculty on our team sold their time to other departments, and we got them to give us money, and then we used their money for spatial biz because it was a priority, and we wanted to see what could happen if we did our best. And that's what we challenged ourselves and said, as a team, and our team's much bigger than we are, as a team, if we did our best, and wrung all the performance out of it we could. How good could we do? What would that mean for retention and performance, differential retention and performance in our engineering student population? And what is the price of that? So I just sent all this stuff to our dean last night, right? I didn't give him a lot of time to be able to do something before today because we're a work in progress, and we'd like to see this funded in some other way, ultimately, but. We, we believe that we needed to get good research-based results, and we're just now comfortable that we've got a pretty good working model. We still need to tune it with our international students, um, and then we need to find ways to do this less expensively. And Jamie, Jamie has uh, I have, hate to... Go ahead. Go, go ahead and answer one more question that we're very much at the end of our time, so we need to wrap up. But I think we can also um, answer the questions that have come through that we haven't had an opportunity to answer uh, in written form associated with the resource for the webinar. So uh, we can follow up with people in terms of answering their specific questions. Go ahead, uh, Jacob, and answer Jamie's question. Great. Quickly, Jamie asks, do you have any preliminary data on longer-term retention and our student success? Uh, short answer, uh, we, we've seen, we, we've looked at one course, Statics, that's a sophomore level uh, engineering course, mechanical engineering course. Other than that, we have plans. And so we do plan on looking at that just like Dr. Sorby has at, at Michigan Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, and, we'll, we'll, and in Statics, we saw a performance difference, an actual grade performance difference that is correlated with their performance in spatial visualization. But that's just way too early to go prime time with. We're looking at that very much. So at this point, we've had opportunity to talk with Jackie and Jacob about their own process, some of the barriers they experienced, and how they use data to help refine and evolve their intervention to the point that it is now, that they're still continuing to evolve their work, but they're fairly satisfied on certain key points, which is fabulous. Um, but we want to get a sense of what you perceive your barriers will be. Given the research, it really is a, a broadening participation issue. If, if we expect all of our student, students to be successful, it is clearly um, behooves us to offer an intervention program for as a prerequisite for those students that enter our programs without spatial visualization experience. So if you would continue to just take a quick um, answer, uh, the poll below, I see that most people have responded. And I think we'll give five more seconds for people to respond. And then we'd like Jacob and Jackie to briefly um, respond to what they see. So OK, we're going to go ahead and Greg, thank you for broadcasting the results so that others can see what we've got. Go ahead, Jackie and Jacob, if you would respond. It looks like cost and time are the things that people perceive to be the greatest barrier. Any thoughts on that? Well, back to the thought we shared earlier, I think as an institution and a strategy, a strategic level at the engineering college is what is the cost of not doing this? What is the cost in terms of loss of students loss of sense of self-efficacy, thinking engineering's not for me, I'm going to transfer to arts and science. What is the cost of not doing it? And our own results say if 32% um, if of our women come in without this very learnable skill that is highly associated with retention in engineering, odds are we have spent more than this to recruit those students who leave. And then, it, it comes down to the larger societal issue of who belongs in engineering. And, and so for us, it's a broadening participation issue. We actually think of this over the big picture. This is not very expensive uh, because the cost of not doing it is so much greater. Can't say you're going to broaden participation and set all these goals at the college level and have such 
implementable, evidence-based change at our fingertips and not do it. It's unconscionable. We, for us, we just don't <laughs> believe we're operating in the circle of integrity if we don't do it. We are at the top of our hour, and I want to just take people to one last question as we begin to wrap up, and we will then share with you the files and uh, papers that we have available to you. We want this webinar to encourage you to move to the next step. It's all about taking action. We want to help you take the action that is necessary to implement this work. We feel that strongly about the, what the research has to tell us and also about what the availability of, of successful interventions have to tell us. So what is your next step to bring this to your students? Let's, I'd like everybody to be thinking about their response here. We'll just take a few more seconds but it really is about action. You know the data now. And if, you're, if you need to know more data, we've got recommended reading for you that we'll share with you so that you can enrich your understanding from a research base further. But you could tell from um, Susan's introduction that over 50 years of research has really come down to those three key final summary points enough to drive us to the point that we absolutely need to engage in an inter intervention if we are to broaden participation. OK. I love that at this point, the majority of people are going to explore the engaged step-by-step -step spatial visualization skills training implementation website. Fabulous. We will be sharing that with you um, in our link here. Let me take you to our resources. And while we do this, I want to just extend a warm and hug-filled thank you to Jackie and Jacob. This has been a wonderful experience. We have pushed the boundaries as we've created this fabulous webinar. Uh, and I think it's very informative. It gives people a uh, foundation for, to push off of to develop their own webinars, I mean, their own uh, inter interventions. And I think the resources that are available at Engage will certainly help people do that. So below our audience members, please take a look at the files that we've got available to you. Jacob uh, even shared with you examples of the orthographic paper uh, and the isometric paper that he uses in teaching his course. He gave you an example of his first week lesson plan. Um, we've even given you a copy of the detailed budget that Jackie developed. So you have some very clear details to get yourself going. We've also um, provided as files, you, again, you can upload those files directly right now, should you desire to, um, about the articles. Most recently, hot off the press as of Monday, actually, is a paper that's going to see um, by Jackie and Jacob and others. Um, so it's right off the press. I encourage you to take a look at that draft paper. That's fabulous piece of work, as well as their recent ASWE paper from 2015. If you want more background, Susan Metz's overview, a 2012 overview, and also Sorby and Bartman's um, work in 2000, all of those are seminal pieces that will get you started. So at this point, I just ask one more thing of you, and that is to please give us feedback about this webinar. We want to know, did we accomplish, meet your expectations? Our intentions surely were, and we looked at the registration information and got a sense of what you were interested in. So if you would, just take a quick moment. I'm going to drive you to that in a screen that you could just answer the questions right now. We'd love your feedback and so appreciate your time and attention. So at this point, please anticipate that we will also be following up with a link to the recording, as well as a link to the website where you can find all of these pieces of information and more. Um, and yet, at the main, the main takeaway point that we want you to walk away with is please do something to address this spatial visualization deficit in some of your students. Thank you very like much, everybody. Like thank you, and too. I, Gretel, thank you so much for your help. 
<laughs> yes, it's been fabulous. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you for taking the time. This is very important work. Much appreciated. We'll send you on your way and hope that you're all fired up. I love it. Wendy says, I'm all fired up. You go, girl. Make it happen. This is all about making change. Bye, everybody. <laughs>